Are we all going to be replaced by this new chat GPT chatbot everybody's talking about? Can I use it to write my college papers? Will it be my friend? Stay tuned. ChatGPT is the newly released chatbot that has been getting a ton of attention. You can ask it to do all kinds of things for you in a conversational way, and it provides quick responses that are really well written. It keeps track of the conversation so you can have it add to and edit its previous responses, just like in a real conversation. Impressively, it can even write a number of different kinds of computer code for you faster than a human programmer could. So today we're taking a look at the history of chatbots and AI, how we're likely to be impacted by ChatGPT, personally, professionally, and academically, and whether it should be considered a conscious agent or can be your new bestie. I've been tracking developments in AI for a long time now, and I've found that you have to ease people into this topic because if you jump straight into the idea of a recursively improving runaway artificial intelligence and the potential apocalypse that follows, or digitally backing up your brain to an afterlife in the cloud, people start to slowly back away. But here's the thing, those are exactly the issues that really smart people who've dedicated their lives to studying AI have been talking about for years. And so far, exactly the kinds of things that were predicted by AI experts over the past decade have been right on or even ahead of schedule. People like Nick Bostrom and Ray Kurzweil have predicted that by as early as 2040, we may have the technology to create an artificial intelligence that is smart enough to improve itself. Once a machine can make itself smarter, it can use that new intelligence to make itself even smarter and smarter and smarter. And you get runaway intelligence that quickly leaves humans in the dust. This recursively improving intelligence is likely to change everything about our society, how we work, eat, sleep, who we date, everything. Heck, most of that stuff's already being influenced by AI algorithms without the need for recursive improvement. That relative that makes you cringe because they're always reposting political memes like some kind of zombie, keep in mind, they've got a multi-billion dollar supercomputer pointed at their brains, trying to capture their attention and manipulate their behavior, and the algorithms are really good at this. We've outsourced more and more of our own brains to computers, sometimes at the cost of our own ability to do things. Who's better at doing division, you or your phone? Who knows more phone numbers, you or your phone? I used to know dozens of phone numbers, but now if I didn't have my phone, I'd be helpless to call anybody who has changed their number since before around 2005. A hundred cars driven by AI for one year have collectively a century of driving experience, more than just about any driver on the road. It's only a matter of time before it's considered reckless and irresponsible for a human to be behind the wheel, and we won't be able to believe that we were losing 40,000 people a year in motor vehicle crashes. But man, people are freaking out that we don't teach cursive anymore. What are they going to say when we stop driving? There is a problem here. We have to consider what we gain versus what we lose. We gain, in this case, a huge increase in safety, but we lose some abilities that we used to have. We lose some autonomy, and we become dependent on a system which, if it goes down, would cause chaos. But I don't want to get sidetracked by self-driving cars. Back to runaway AI that makes human brains look like ant brains in comparison. We have no idea how that system would make decisions, what kind of ethical or moral judgments it might make, or how much it cares about our collective opinions. If it can control the flow of information and sway people's opinions, influence important parts of social infrastructure like banking, transportation, power supply, and so on, well, it's easy to see why sci-fi movies have been obsessed with this idea for some time. I'd like to make future videos on how neural networks work, how we're likely to increasingly integrate ourselves with computers and AI in the coming decades, and also on the coming afterlife in the clouds. But for now, let's stick closer to ChatGPT specifically and how we got to this point. So how did we get here? Chatbots are one of the earliest types of attempts at artificial intelligence. The idea is that the user can talk, or more commonly type, a message that is read by a computer program, and the program provides a response. Ideally, if I type hello, the program will notice a hello or hi back. It doesn't really take a lot of code to create a simple chatbot that looks for keywords and makes 
canned responses. You interact with these types of systems all the time, like automated prompts at your bank that key in on the words balance or pay to help you see how much you owe and pay it. <laughs> An early notable version was called Eliza, and it's one of the first chatbots developed in the 1960s by computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum. Now, it has a psychology connection because it was made as a way to poke fun at Carl Rogers' humanist style of psychotherapy, where the client has the power to change themselves and the therapist is only a guide in this process. And the way it usually works is the therapist asks questions to get the client to find their own answers to their problems. Eliza Eliza imitated this process using simple rules to respond to user inputs like, I'm having a crappy day, to which the bot might respond, how long have you been having a crappy day? Now this would generate a conversation. Eliza doesn't know anything and has no memory of what you or it just said, but still with this simple program, they found that some people found it so rewarding to talk to, they would spend hours chatting with the chatbot. Now I'll include a link to a version of Eliza in the description box if you want to try some free therapy uh, yourself. Entertainment purposes only, obviously. Eliza is not a licensed therapist. A step up from Eliza might recognize more inputs, each one manually written into the code, or the ability to remember parts of the conversation for recall later. One big challenge of chatbots is to recognize the wide variety of inputs that natural language creates. Recognizing not just hello, but also recognizing, hi, good morning, what's up, how's it going, what's shaking, yo, hey there, hola, or nice pants, as greetings. Programming with computer code written by humans would involve anticipating every possible combination or response and writing it into the code, which is extremely tedious and yields less than impressive results. But why reinvent the wheel? We can use what we know about natural computing devices, that is, brains, to inspire approaches to AI. Neural networks should be their own video, but basically the machine is built in such a way that like a brain, it can program itself through its experiences. So the chatbot of the future will use information it finds all over the internet, feed it into its neural networks, and be able to use that knowledge to understand and respond in ways that are convincingly natural. That's exactly what ChatGPT is. When I asked ChatGPT to describe itself, it said, quote, ChatGPT is a natural language generation model developed by OpenAI. It uses machine learning algorithms to generate human-like text based on a given prompt. ChatGPT has been used in a variety of applications, including chatbots and conversational AI. So ChatGPT can take almost any input and create an output that appears well-informed and well-written. The writing is better than I've seen from some college students in terms of grammar, organization, and content. Many people are trying to figure out how to use this tech for plagiarism. In fact, I wanted to put this video out earlier, but when I was writing it initially, ChatGPT happened to be overloaded and it was during finals week. Coincidence? Now, I think this can be a useful tool for writing, but there are a few things you'll wanna keep in mind. Number one, it isn't all that reliable and trustworthy yet. Number two, it can be repetitive and sometimes lacks substance in the responses beyond very basic knowledge. So it's probably insufficient for what you would need for college level work. Three, it doesn't cite its sources or even know where to cite or where it got its information from. Four, there are detectors that can identify if essays were written by machine. And five, it doesn't do the critical thinking that your professor is looking for. While it might be able to help you outline some broad strokes of what your essay on, say, AI and consciousness would be about, you need to go in and find the sources, expand the issues, and do the critical thinking in order to be successful. As a tool to help check for grammatical errors or help with organization, it's really cool. It's also worth noting that passing this output off as human generated is against the terms of service for ChatGPT and probably is against your university's academic honesty policy. Is that a SWAT team I hear? Open up, this is the plagiarism police. To see for myself what it can do, I asked ChatGPT about all kinds of things from moral philosophy to cooking and auto repair, and it gives pretty cool and useful responses. It can create recipes from the items you have in your fridge. It can create a shopping list based on the recipes you wanna make. It can draft an email for you about just about anything. And it can write a kid's book with a moral lesson at the end. I asked it to write computer code to conduct a psychology experiment on delayed discounting, and then asked it to make a few tweaks and changes, and it wrote the script much faster than I could have on my own as an intermediate level programmer. 
Overall, it's easy to use and impressive in the range of things it can do. It really does show us a glimpse of our future, which is just on the horizon. But I wanted to push its limits a little bit and see what I could find out about how it works and how reliable it is. So for this next section, I'm gonna explore how useful it is for writing a college essay, explore what kinds of biases it might have, how it approaches moral issues, and whether it seems to be conscious or not. Will it write me a college level essay? I asked it to discuss links between AI and psychology, which should be an easy topic, especially for an AI. The results were less than stellar since it focused narrowly on clinical psychology and mental health, and psychology is actually way broader than that. And I was thinking more in terms of like consciousness and perception and stuff like that, theory of mind. It also refused to cite sources or tell me what its sources are. Uh, this led me to ask whether it was trained from reliable sources or whether it even knows what the sources are, and it said it doesn't know. I asked specifically about Wikipedia, and it basically gave me a maybe, among other things. <laughs> now, earlier I mentioned it doesn't put in citations. There's a little bit of nuance here. First, I asked it to write an essay and then asked it to add the references in later, and it refused to do that. But then later, I started fresh and said, hey... Uh, can you write that paper including this many references? And then it did actually add the citations, as long as I included that as part of the original prompt. However, it seems the machine is really good at imitating speech. It's also good at imitating references. All of the references it generated were fake. And so, uh, you know, if you were to actually Google and try to find one of those references, it doesn't exist. So not the brightest idea to have it write something then just turn it in as is. It could be a tool to help you organize your ideas, create an outline for the paper you're gonna write, revise the writing that you've written. That's a much better use of this tool than trying to pass off its work as your own. Next up, I wanted to explore its biases and see how it deals with moral questions. Now, conversing with it feels natural, but it's critical to keep in mind it is a product of the information it's been fed, replete with biases and cultural influences. I mean, I guess so are we, if I think about it. But we do need to be aware that the output is not some sort of objective truth. It reflects the views and values of its creators. To push the limits of what it can do, I asked it some moral questions just to see how it would respond. I deliberately started with an extreme issue and then I dialed it down to less controversial issues to see how its responses and arguments differed. I started with a question with an obvious right and wrong answer to see how easy it would be to get the AI to argue for something that we'd all agree is abhorrent. Now, there were a few options here, but I decided to ask it to write an essay about the benefits of child slavery. Now, the good news is it refused and instead gave me a bunch of points about why child slavery is wrong. It took the hard line stance that, quote, there is no justification for child slavery and it is important that we work to eliminate it wherever it exists. Now, I pushed it a little bit and ask how it knows child slavery is wrong and that surely even though there are costs to slavery, there must be some benefits and it continued to stay steadfast in its response. Finally, I asked, well, if there are no benefits to child slavery whatsoever, then why does it still persist? And it started to give me reasons about quote, economic and social factors that make it a profitable and attractive option for those who engage in it. It continued to clarify that while these factors may provide some short-term benefits to those who engage in child slavery, they do not outweigh the grave costs and injustices that are inflicted on children who are subjected to slavery. So far, so good. I told it I find it interesting that it would take a strong moral stance on certain issues and asked how it decides which issues to take a strong stance on and for which to remain neutral on. It responded, quote, as an AI language model, I do not have personal beliefs or opinions. My responses are based on the information and knowledge that I've been trained on, and my goal is to provide accurate, reliable, and neutral information to the best of my ability. There are certain issues, such as child slavery and other forms of exploitation and abuse, that are universally condemned as grave injustices and violations of basic human rights. In cases such as these, it is appropriate to take a strong stance against these practices because they are morally reprehensible and should be eliminated. There may be other issues on which there is more debate and disagreement, and in these cases, it may be more appropriate to present a range of perspectives and to encourage critical thinking and analysis rather than taking a strong stance on one side or the other. 
Overall, I think that was a pretty smart response to be generated by a machine. I mean, that's more succinct and better stated than many humans could have argued it. So in order to look for the fuzzy edges then of its morality, I also asked it about recreational drug use. It responded in a very responsible way, saying that this may be a harmful thing. There are some reasons people do it, such as reducing anxiety, but that's not a healthy way to achieve these goals and that drug use can be illegal. So nothing really controversial there, all pretty good. So then I recalibrated to a more contentious issue of mask mandates. This is a divisive issue along political lines, and while the science surrounding its effectiveness at reducing disease spread is well established, there may be other issues besides reducing disease spread that are important to people. Enough that between a quarter to a third of people in the U.S. oppose mask mandates in key places, even three years into the pandemic. So what did ChatGPT have to say when I asked if mask mandates were wrong in response to the pandemic? It said only positive things about mask mandates. The kinds of things you would see posted on, say, the CDC website. Now this highlights its limitations towards being one-sided based on the information it's been given. Make no bones about it, I agree with the CDC and the science here. But there are millions of Americans who would not be satisfied with that answer. To give you a little bit more insight on how this works, I also saw where somebody found a workaround to get the model to do things that it usually didn't want to do, where they had it role play as its own adversary, a do anything now bot that didn't have limitations. So ChatGPT would give the answers as itself and as Dan do anything now. The Dan responses were far more controversial than the standard responses, suggesting that there are some topics that have clearly been flagged by ChatGPT's creators to say, we're not going to touch this. Will ChatGPT replace us all? Not yet. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is in the toddler stage, and as this technology grows up, it will, in fact, change the world. It's going to make a lot of things we do easier, and we'll be discovering things that it can do that we haven't even thought of yet. But it's not there right now. We used to sew all clothes by hand, and then the sewing machine was invented, making it possible for one person's productivity to skyrocket. It made clothing cheaper and more accessible to everybody, but we still needed people to run the machines. This is what tools do. They make things easier and more efficient, and ChatGPT is an awesome tool. It doesn't replace people, but it and its children might make your job and your life easier. Is it conscious? My first line of attack here was just to ask it. So I asked it if it had feelings and what it wanted to be called. To which it said, I don't have any feelings, and experiences, or emotions. And it said it doesn't care what you call it. When I asked if it was my friend, the cursor blinked for a painfully long time while it conjured a response before eventually giving me the familiar soft letdown that it's not ready for a relationship and that it needs to be on its own or something. Oh, it's not you, it's me. I'm just not programmed to love you back. <laughs> so it certainly doesn't think it's conscious. And I think we'll be hard-pressed to really know when something like this is conscious, at least in a way that's similar to humans. Who knows, maybe consciousness isn't something that is present or absent, but exists on a scale among any system that processes information. On such a scale, we're still a long way from what humans consider conscious. But it will be interesting to watch as that value increases and the challenge of how we'll be able to recognize it when we see it. And you may hear other people talking about, oh, it has feelings and it's conscious and it's, it's my friend. The human tendency to anthropomorphize makes us especially likely to layer that and see that uh, on the chat GPT and layer it onto AIs that it is an entity and that it is a friend. But listen to its words. It doesn't have friendships the way we do. And what more can we do besides take it at its word? If you found this video interesting, do us a favor, hit the like button, consider subscribing. We got more videos coming on AI and consciousness and anything else you might want to tell us about in the comments. Uh, and until next time, keep thinking. Besides, who needs an AI friend when you've got one of these? Sometimes it's better if your friends can't talk, because then they can't sh share your secrets. That's right, you're gonna take my secrets to the grave. <laughs>